It's the day of the Lord, and we are, and I am, excited for what the Lord has for us. I'm excited for His Word, though there are a few things that I don't understand fully, even a text that we have today, <laughs> but His grace is sufficient for us. He will, if we seek after Him, cause us to understand and cause us to know Him more. So it is my desire that we'll always open our eyes and our understanding so that the Lord can meet us here. So thank you for being here today as we go through His Word. Last week we were in chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, and today we'll try to finish it up, um, verses 8 to 22, God willing. So we talked about wives, mostly last week, to be subject to their own husbands and also the husbands to dwell with them with understanding. Now this week we happen to be in a conference, the uh, Pastors and Wives Conference, and one of the guys who was speaking to us was uh, an older gentleman who has been married for uh, 46 years old, and he's serving God as a missionary, training pastors and leaders. And so when we were gathered together and said, hey, you know this part, uh, I still don't understand. <laughs> After 46 years of marriage, there are things that my wife does today that I normally scratch my head to think about. And I have come to the conclusion that I will try as much as I can to understand and I will fully not understand until when we depart from this planet. <laughs> it is very hard. And it's not like it's now easier for the ladies to understand their gentlemen. It is as hard too. You're like, he did this yesterday, today he does something crazy like, did you consult your yesterday <laughs> before you did this one today? You know, it's amazing how God has fashioned us, but nevertheless will continue from where we left. Verses 8, the Bible says, Finally, all of you, be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tender-hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil. This is in Psalms 34. And his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer, and you should, hallelujah. <laughs> and even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your heart and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience 
that when they defame you as evildoers, those who reviled your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better if it's the will of God to suffer for doing good than doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in this, by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prisons, <laughs> who formerly were disobedient when once the divine's long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. There is also antitype which now saves us, baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. Wow. Well, this is those texts that will crack your head a little bit when you try to think about what the apostle was talking about. As if he's forgetting what he said about the apostle Paul. He said, hey, this brother Paul, the things he writes are difficult for us to understand. But we ask the Holy Spirit to help us get a grasp of what he's talking to us today. And this is a bit of a continuation of what he was talking uh, to the wives and the husbands. And this is, you know, clothing, I would call it, clothing to the couple. What do you need to clothe yourselves with? How do you need to behave? He say, finally, all of you be of one mind. Number one, be like-minded. Okay, as you're living together, as you're submitting yourself to the authority of the man or the man giving honor to the woman. Actually, happy Mother's Day. It's a Mother's Day today, right? Man, women have a lot of events throughout the year. <laughs> it's a Mother's Day, it's a Women's Day, it's a day to remember the girl child. It's, it's a lot of them that we don't remember. We, we have to see a lot of things for us to be reminded. So those mothers who are here, God bless you. You're doing a great job raising up children in this current world. It's not easy. It is by the grace of God that you guys are doing that. So God bless you. Can we give a hand to the mothers in the house? Amen. So, be like-minded, that is to be in one mind, to be in harmony with one another. For if you are in harmony with one another, it means you will be able to submit or the man will be able to give honor because you are together. You're dwelling together. Number two, he says, be compassionate, that is to be sympathetic with the other. And in the original Greek translation, it means to suffer or feeling pain together. So in other words, it's saying, hey, if you are to feel pain, then feel it together. Feel it together. Don't let the other one suffer while you're trying to enjoy life out there. Be together. Be together. This is the heart of God for everyone and for every family. Be together. Be of one mind. Be compassionate. Sympathize with one another. 
And he says again, you know, love as brothers, brotherly love, meaning be friendly to one another, wish one another well, be the associate of one another as you're living together, as you're dwelling together. Plan things together. Work things out together. When there's trouble, sit down, talk it out, find a better solution, and move on with life. Why? Because the marriage institution, as God has ordained it, it should actually show forth God's goodness to the world. That when people see you as a married man and woman, they should say, hey, this is actually God's picture here on earth. We are preaching with our lives as we are living with one another. You're being kind to one another. You're loving one another as Christ loved us. Be friendly to one another. When, when people get to a crossroad, it's very easy for them to confine to a friend confined to a friend. We know that even for those who are not married, we know that, that I will call my buddy, I will call my friend, or I will find solace in a good friend. If your spouse is not a good friend, I'm wondering where you're going to, you know, pour out all this frustration, not just even frustration, even good news. And we've always discouraged this idea of, you know, a lady has a best friend who is a man, <laughs> or a man having a best friend who is a lady. No, don't do that. Don't do that. Oh, my bestie, my bestie. <laughs> you are Susan, your bestie is John. Don't do that. Because when, you know, you... Continue to pour out yourself and your friends and you're giving all this, you know, you're, you're finding a shoulder to lean on, on a man. There's always a soft spot for a man towards women. And they, they tend to listen more. When it's a man, we'll give you straight facts in the next few seconds and we're done. If you want to follow them, follow them. Man up. Style up and be a man. But for the ladies, tend to go slow. And that, you know, soft spot will tend to lead this woman towards the man. Why? Because he's the one who always listens to us and he does this to us. I know that from experience. Okay, I was a teacher in a girls' school. And I was their pastor for three years. And God was merciful that time. Amen. <laughs> I'll never go back. Never go back to doing that again. So these girls will always confine in me. They come with their troubles and they cry. And you see cries and you're, oh. They did that to you. Oh. No, it's not good. <laughs> so you, and you would send them to the, uh, the patrons who are ladies and they don't want to go. Why? Because they will be given straight facts to help them, and they don't want to help. They want to entertain some sort of a distant relationship. And they'll go back and brag to their fellow girls, I was with the chaplain. We were talking. You don't know what we were talking about, right? It's very dangerous. The Lord delivered me. <laughs> Oh, the Lord delivered me from the snares that I brought upon myself. Brotherly love. Be friendly. Be friendly. Be pitiful. Act well towards one another. Be kind to one another as you live together. Be courteous. That is, humbling yourselves to one another. Wanting the very best for another. The other versions would say, lowly minded. Be courteous. Don't be mkatiaji. Be courteous. Be courteous. Lowly minded. Wanting the very best 
for another, right? Imagine if couples or just any other Christ, Christian, we wanted to outdo one another in doing good. We want to serve. The, the, the husband wants to serve the wife and the wife wants to serve the husband. Think about that kind of life. What would come out of it? Blessings and blessings and blessings. And all are called to inherit a blessing. That is why he say, hey, be kind to one another. Be compassionate. You know, employ brotherly love. Be pitiful. Be kind. Be courteous. All these things. Why? Because we are called to inherit a blessing. We are called to inherit a blessing from the Lord. And now in this, the next section, he gives us instruction for better lives. It says in verse 10, For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil. So number one, if you want to see better life, refrain. That is no longer will you be stirred up by sins, incitements, and seductions. Do not be incited by the enemy to do things or be seduced by the enemy because he knows what to say to us. He knows how to get us. He knows how gently he will come to us. And he wants us to follow him. But I say, if, if you want better life, if you want to see better days, refrain yourself from sinful desires or actions. That is number one. And number two, turn away. Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away. This is the best definition of repentance. Repentance means to turn around, turn away from this direction to this direction. I was following my own desires. I have experienced the Lord. I will follow his desires. I am turning away. If you want to see better days ahead of you, turn away. Repent. Refrain from sinful actions. Repent from them. And number three, seek. Seek the Lord. It says here, seek peace and pursue it. Seek. Why do you seek? In order to find out. By thinking, by meditating, by reasoning, by inquiring, all these things. So that you will know the heart of God. That will be possible when you have repented. And you're seeking after him. You're striving after. And then number four, he says, do right. Do right. Why? Because the Lord is watching. Say, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. Never think at one point that you can run away from the Lord. He knows you. He knows your steps before you make them. Your thought process before they are processed in your mind. He knows everything. So when you're doing right, you're doing right when you are with people and even when you are alone. It is very easy for us to try to do right when we are with other people, to impress, to give a good impression that, hey, I'm a good person, I can do this, I bless people, I help. But when we are alone, it's a different ballgame. Do good at all times. Why? Because the Lord is watching. You want to see better life? Do right. 
And be encouraged, number five, that God answers prayers. He says here, and his ears are open to their prayers. God answers prayers. Why? Because you have refrained. You have turned away. You're seeking the Lord. You're doing right. He will heed to your voice. He will listen to you. The Lord listens to a sinner's prayer. A heart that is steadfast to him. The Lord will not um, refrain from but this warning continues, said, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. The face of the Lord is against. The face of the Lord resists those who do evil. As he says in James, he lifts the humble. And to the proud he does what? He brings them down. He brings them down. Whatever prayers you might have, you think he doesn't listen. As your child, he listens. He knows a better time for him to respond. There are prayers we probably prayed five years back, ten years back. He will probably answer them tomorrow. You never know. There are prayers he will respond to and, you know, do it immediately because he's God and he knows what is best for every one of us. So after giving us an instruction for better lives, he jumps to this other section, says, and who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? If God is for us, who can be against us? If you're doing the will of God, who is that who will harm you? Who is that? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. <laughs> this is important for us to get. Because we are told with many other people in the world out there, that blessings means, you know, having a good car, having a big house, having a lot of money, and all these things. But listen to what the apostle is saying, that even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, do not be afraid. If you should suffer, you are blessed. <laughs> what are these blessings? That the fact that you, you are relaxed in the presence of God, the, the, the fact that you have this knowledge that you have done right and people are just accusing you wrongly, the fact that you will have that peace in your heart, you're blessed already. It is a blessing to have God's peace in the middle of turmoils of life, in the middle of all the troubles of life. You're blessed. I mean, if, if I would have nothing else today, I am blessed. I am blessed of the Lord. If my car would break down and never works again, I am blessed of the Lord. Because he who watches from above is watching over me. His hand of protection is upon my life. I am blessed. If you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you're blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats. No troubles. You know, the, how we structure God's blessing is just, it's weird. You know, we have people who are Stress eaters, right? When they're stressed, they will eat and eat and eat. And they will add a little bit more weight. <laughs> and people look at them like, wow, they've added even some weight. They are blessed. 
They do not know what you're going through. They don't know the reason behind the weight you have added. They don't know. That is not how we structure God's blessing. We are blessed anyways. The fact that we are known by him and we know him, we are blessed. He goes on to say in verses 15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So in this part, how do we acknowledge the Lord? Number one, by sanctifying the Lord in our hearts. That means to separate from profane things and dedicate ourselves to God. To totally separate ourselves from any other thing that will take you off the course of the gospel. Separate yourself. Take yourself off that company, off that group of people, off that WhatsApp group that you added, but you don't want to leave because sometimes they are funny and they, they annoy you every time. That is not being kind and gentle. <laughs> that is your, your, you're not helping yourself in anything by doing that. Separate yourself. Hey, but sanctify the Lord in your heart. Sanctify the Lord in your heart. Set him apart in your heart. And when the Lord is set apart in our hearts, you know what happens? Our direction becomes more clearer. Because we are led by him. We have set him apart in our hearts. He guides us. He leads us. And he says, also, be ready to testify. Of what? Of God's faithfulness. And also, joyful and confident expectation of eternal salvation. This is the verse that we use for apologetics. Give a defense for the hope that you have in Christ when you are asked about it. Because he knows that you will be asked about it. Like, hey, why are you so happy? You know what? Why are you a Christian? Well, I go to church every Sunday. <laughs> I attend fellowships, you know. I go for Bible clubs. I do all these things. I help people. Why are you a Christian? That is not why you're a Christian. So always be ready to give a defense. And as you're trying to get yourself ready to do that, he warns us also. Because when we are puffed up with a lot of information and we know things, we go out there with a lot of pride. You know, going out there that I want to pin them down. He thinks he's a Muslim enough. I have these 10 points, these 17 points, this whatever point. You're ready to defend yourself. <laughs> you're not ready to defend the gospel. He says... You do that with meekness and fear. Because where you're supposed to go is drive straight to their hearts, not their heads. Because they have a lot of information too. But if you bypass something and drive to their heart, they normally have no defense for that. You talk about God's love. To them, it's amazing. You talk about, you know, salvation. They don't get it. It's amazing. You know. As you're giving a defense, do that with meekness and fear. 
you know, this, why are you always excited anyway? Why are you always joyful? And it's always a joy of mine and a blessing to see older men and women who are walking with the Lord and you see their faces smiling and they are happy and you ask them for advice. They say, love one another. <laughs> it's like, wow. I want to be old and love God deeply. When you love God deeply, you will love his people dearly. So always be ready. And lastly say, have a good conscience too. Have a good conscience as you do that. Having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better if it's the will of God to suffer for doing good than for evil. <laughs> so it still encourages, if at all we will suffer for doing good, it is the will of God. You know, people would ask, hey, what is the will of God for my life? <laughs> I know one of them is to, to snatch people from the pit of hell. The other one is to suffer for his sake, <laughs> that is his will. And the list goes on and on and on and on. I don't want to suffer for my own selfish ambitions. That would be painful. But if I do suffer and I suffer for doing right, man, it's a blessing. It's a blessing. And those people in turn, when you do that, they will be ashamed. They will be ashamed. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, the Spirit in him, the Spirit of God, by whom also, we, also he went and preached to the Spirit in prison. Now, this is one of those <laughs> scriptures that I was thinking of, just don't talk about it, because I don't know nothing about it. <laughs> okay, he speaks about the spirits. He speaks about the prisons. But worst of all, he takes us back to the times of Noah. What is he thinking? I honestly don't get it. <laughs> I don't get it. But let's read it. It is God's word. Perhaps when we are reading it, the Lord will open your understanding to get it. Say, by whom also he went and preached or proclaimed to the spirits in prison who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. <laughs> Many of the things I will talk about this part is that there are speculations. Okay. Speaking about Jesus Christ, of course, this, this verse has been used wrongly by the Roman Catholic for uh, purgatory. They say, well, there's a verse in the Bible that talks about that, that Christ went in hell, and this actually does not talk about hell, and he spoke to those people who already died so that perhaps those who repent will, be, will have a chance to see the kingdom of God. If that was to be taught, it cannot be taught with a single verse in the whole, the entire Bible. There has to many other parts that will talk about it. But that is not the case. And also, he speaks about spirits and prison. So which are these spirits 
in prison. The one little clue that we have is the next verse, what it's talking about. It says, so who formerly were disobedient? Okay, so we are having a hint that these people who are in prison, they were formerly disobedient. But these times are way back disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited. You guys remember the story of Noah. God calls Noah into ministry as he calls any one of us. Okay. We are not even 15 years old, this church. <laughs> but Noah preached for 120 years without a convert. I don't know what would translate to in these times if you would preach and preach and preach. Let's say you're, you're, you're 20 years old. You started to preach. You're 140. People don't listen. People don't listen. I don't know the heart condition of this man. But one thing he did, he was obedient to the call of God. He continued to build the ark in faith that whatever I am doing, however much it feels foolish, I'm going to do it anyways. He did it. And these other people who were disobedient did not heed the voice of God even when he was so patient with them. They did not heed the voice of God. Why? Because... Noah talked about rain. That you guys are disobedient to God. He will bring rain and it will destroy the earth. And that was unheard of in that time. Why? Because God was watering the ground from down there. You know, they've never seen rain. And Noah is saying, hey, there's something that is coming from above. You guys need to listen. They did not. But at the same time, he who came from above went underneath and he spoke, he proclaimed his word to this spirit, not that they would be born again, but to tell them, hey, you refuse to hear my voice through Noah. Look at what has become of you people. There's no salvation for them. But he wants them to be aware that you rejected God. These are my own speculations. Amen. Go study for yourself and see what the Lord tells you about this part. When once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few were saved, those were eight people, his family members, were saved. There is also an antitype which now saves baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we want to talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Number one, the crucifi crucifixion of Jesus Christ shows purpose. His crucifixion shows purpose. Jesus suffered that he might bring us to God. That was the purpose of him being crucified. And we, we thought that, man, this was the worst thing that ever happened. But the worst thing that happened became the best thing that could happen to us. I want to read you a statement from this guy called Paul Crift. He was a professor at Yale University. He says, suppose you are the devil. 
So all of you seated there, suppose you are the devil. Okay, don't, you, you guys don't want to think about it. I'm the devil. <laughs> suppose you were the devil. You are the enemy of God and you want to kill him. <laughs> you want to kill God. But you can't. However, he has this ridiculous weakness of creating and loving human beings. Loving human beings who you can get at. Aha! Uh -huh. Now you've got hostages. You simply come down into the world, corrupt humankind, and drag some of them to hell. And when God sends prophet to enlighten them, you kill the prophet. God does the foolish things of all times. He sends his own son to play by the rules of the world. So you say to yourself, I can't believe he's that stupid. Love has addled his brain. All I have to do is to inspire some of my agents. Herod, Pilate, Caiaphas, the Roman soldiers. And get him crucified. And that's what you do. So, there he hangs on the cross. Forsaken by man. And seemingly by God. Bleeding to death. And crying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What do you feel now as the devil? <laughs> what do you feel now as the devil? You feel triumph and vindicated. But of course, you couldn't be more wrong. This is a supreme triumph and your supreme defeat. He struck his heels into your mouth and you beat it and that blood destroyed you. Now, if this occurrence is not unique, perhaps it points out that when we suffer and bleed, it is God's way of defeating Satan all over again. Most of the well-known Christians in history seem to say that they've grown closest to God when they've suffered the most. What a brilliant way to help us understand the concept of what the enemy does and what Jesus did at the cross. He suffered that we might be brought us, brought back to God. And number two, Jesus' resurrection shows permanence. Why? Because he will not die again. He died once and for all. Shows permanence. And number three, Jesus' proclamation shows planning. Lastly, Jesus' exaltation shows power. He sat at the right hand, the right hand of power in heaven. And every other thing is subject to our Lord Jesus Christ. What a beautiful picture we have from our God our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. That there are many things I don't understand, but this one thing I know, that he died so that I will be restored back to the Father. That my broken relationship is mended by this thing that the, the enemy thought, aha, he's finished. I have triumphed against him. No. He did not. And he didn't know the grand plan of God. He saw Jesus suffering 
Jesus saw us being redeemed. What a wonderful God we serve. It's always amazing to think about the subject of suffering. That is, that is one thing we will avoid as a plague. But of course, we, we don't send ourselves to suffer. But the Bible says that if we should suffer for righteousness' sake, then we are what? We are blessed. Friends, I want to tell you that all of you who are here listening to God's word, you're blessed. Let not the enemy lie to you that you're not. You're all blessed by God. You're all blessed. You're called by God for a reason and a purpose. It's amazing also how this is tied. This one chapter has a lot of things to learn from. Chapter 3. Quite amazing. But let us pay attention. Let us, if we want to see better lives, we have instruction that we have been given here. Instruction for the married couple. Instruction for collective individuals who believe in Christ. Then we shall continue with the suffering subject next week because it's never ending. <laughs> it's not my fault. It is what is written. Chapter 4 begins by saying, therefore, since Christ suffered <laughs> in the flesh, we shall continue thinking about as I bring the worship team to come. I would implore all of us to live such a life that those people who are not born again will be drawn to God. That is through everything that you do in your business, in your school, at your workplace. Can they really see godliness in your life? Can they really see the overflow of God's great love and mercy from you? Finally, all of you, be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love one another. Be tender-hearted. Be courteous. Don't return evil for evil. This feels like an old, very old man who is giving a final benediction to the younger ones. Love one another. Brotherly love. Care for one another. Be mindful of one another. Don't return evil for evil. But if you, if you are to return something, let it be a blessing for a blessing. Blessing, a blessing. Bless people. Bless your family. Those who are married, don't bless your wives, bless your husbands. You know, some people have this notion that, you know, they, they want to look good out there. So they'll you know, give gifts to other people, give things to other people out there. But their family are not enjoying as much blessing as they should. Your primary ministry as a person is to be a blessing to your family. Be a blessing. Cheer people out. They see your smile, they are all happy. I'm happy even my daughter who can't speak was a blessing to a bunch of people in Uganda. She was just happy, happy child. She's walking around, playing around with people, touching people like you see the smiles of people. He's putting a smile on people. I'm like, this little one is putting a smile on people. And myself, I'm busy, <laughs> not even mindful of 
one thing. Have that faith like a child. Faith like a child. Lord, we are thankful. We are thankful for your word. Thankful for the privilege that we have as a people that we can receive your word. We don't receive the baptism of the flesh, but are good conscious towards you, towards what you have taught us, towards your loving kindness. And you say to us in your word that if we love life and we want to see good days, we should refrain from evil, our lips from speaking deceit, that we should turn away from evil and do good and seek you, seek peace and pursue it. For your eyes are upon those who seek you, upon the righteous. And your ears are open to our prayers when we pray to you. Lord, we ask of you this morning that you would open our eyes to see as you see. Make it clear to us the path of righteousness. Make it clear to us what we ought to do as your people. We know through your word that we are all blessed. We are all blessed. And may these blessings overflow to the people around us, to our towns and our workplaces, and the various places you'll send us to. Let your blessings flow. And this morning as we continue our worship, as we give to you, we learn from your word that you gave your son. You gave the only son that we can be reconciled. Lord, as we give to you this morning, let us be reminded to give the best we can. To give a percentage that is glorifying to you. So we thank you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.